Okay. As far as I know, you can see my screen and this is recording. So I'm going to plow ahead and just assume everything is working. If not, or if you're having any trouble, please just hit me up and let me know. So testing, one, two, three. Someone say yes, you can hear me. Okay, sweet. I'm going to keep going then. Um, so, you know, I didn't really have a plan for this. The whole idea was just to get a couple of questions, see where people are struggling, and then uh, hopefully get them answered. So I have like, I don't know, 10 questions or so I'm going to run through. And if anything else comes up while I'm talking, just pop your question into the question box and I'll do my best to answer it live on air. So um, Rob Parnell asked me about how to identify weaknesses and the bed way to target them to improve them faster. Now I'm going to go on a limb here and say he wanted to see the best way to do it. Um, so here's my thing. Um, most people don't really have a specific weakness. They're just weak. You know, the amount of times I get asked by people about uh, how do I get stronger out of the hole on squats um, or, or like I get to the bottom of a squat and sometimes I can't stand up. You know, the problem is there, the weight's just too heavy or you're just too fatigued. Um, certain lifts are always going to get missed in a specific spot. Like a squat, you're almost always going to miss it just below parallel or a couple of inches above. A bench press, you're always going to miss it a couple of inches off your chest. Or if you're one of those freaks who's massively... Uh, massively weak through the triceps you'll probably miss it up the top um so to be honest i don't really think there's one great way to identify any weaknesses um but generally speaking for most people if i was to kind of look at some areas that are weak i'd say pulling strength so your ability to row and do pull-ups um shoulder strength so pressing overhead and then hamstring and glute strength for i'd say about 90 percent of the people that come across maybe even 95 percent they're the areas that are holding them back um, John, I know you're live on air here and you asked a couple of good questions via email a while ago. So I'm going to try and answer your three now. Um, okay, so setting training goals, both long-term and short-term. Let's work backwards. Um, you know, where do you want to be in, let's say, a year's time is too long. Six months' time is probably even too long. 12 weeks is a reasonably good long-term goal. You know, technically... Under the definition of long-term goals, it's not actually that far away, but let's let's just go 12 weeks has been a long-term goal. Um, for most guys, it's probably reasonable to expect somewhere between 6 to 12% body fat reduction over that time period. Um, now, John, I know you're dropping, I think you're down about 8% in the last eight weeks, so you're, you're right on track. Um, so like a, a long-term for guys, like, I personally believe every guy should be aiming for between 12 and 15% body fat as measured by calipers. The reason for that is uh, simply because that's where guys tend to look pretty good. Girls probably between 5 and 8% higher, but uh, for guys, let's say 15, 12 to 15% body fat as a goal. Um, so that's, that's your long-term target. Then it depends where you're at. You know, if you're currently like 40% body fat, I know you're not, but let's let's hypothetically say that. It's not realistic to expect 15% over 12 weeks. It's simply not going to happen. Um, so you need to start thinking about like how long is your goal realistically going to take. So I think, well, I know where your body fat's sitting at the moment because we did it yesterday. So let's say you have probably another, you know, five to 10 weeks of doing what you're doing to get towards that long-term goal of 12 to 15% body fat. That's only one component of it though. Once you get there, you need to figure out how to maintain it and how to keep it. So there's no point to you guys setting a goal, racing to the goal, and then racing away from it again. This is exactly what happens with uh, with Weight Watchers and with, with those style of diets in that you know, you're know you dieting for 12 to 15 weeks, and then all of a sudden it just stops and you go off and eat whatever the hell you want again. So over, the, um, over that time period, what you're effectively doing is running down your metabolism. Like there's no way to diet long term and keep producing calories without having that happen. You need to have structured refeeds. You need to have build ups and drop downs to um to ensure that you don't get fat again off the back of it. So what I'd say is usually the best way to look at this is if it takes you 15 weeks to come back, come down body fat levels, it'll take you about 15 weeks to get back up to normal eating again. And now like when I say normal eating, I don't mean you're going to be eating rabbit food for the for the second half of the program, but just it 
you know, you need to gradually ramp your food back up. There's no reason why you can't get back up to eating 3,000, 4,000 calories a day and still maintaining 12 to 15% body fat. It's all about how you reintroduce the foods and the patience you show over that time period. Um, short-term goals, let's call a short-term goal one week. Best short-term goal, make it to the gym three times. Um, that's like that. That's really simple. Make it to the gym three times and really push hard. Have a savage mentality and go to the point of uncomfortable in each session. Um, with nutrition on a short-term goal plan, let's say seven days good. Get through next weekend. Weekends are where people fall down. Weekends is where all of the good stuff you've done for the previous five days falls apart. So if you can make it through Saturday and Sunday, you're laughing. Um, for me, I know the first weekend I have on a cut, that's like the biggest thing in the world to me. And once I make it through that, the rest of it's going to be smooth. If you make it through the first weekend, then you've got kind of 12 really solid days of good nutrition control. So by the following weekend, you're able to have a slight refeed or maybe a small cheat meal, but nothing obviously out of hand. I um, hope that answers it. I know you're online here, so if you don't, or if you feel like I've left anything out or you need something else um, added into that, just let me know and I'll, I'll come back to it when we've uh, covered everyone else's questions. Um, so should you get DOMS after every workout? No, absolutely not. Um, uh-oh. DOMS is a really poor indicator of how well you've trained okay um with with doms they tend to happen when you do something new so if you've changed your training program recently or if you've um taken a break from the gym you're way more likely to get doms but you know you should never train just for the sake of getting them the goal of a training program for me has to be consistent steady predictable improvement so what you're looking to do there is basically get stronger get more reps or decrease training times um in the form of like high intensity interval blocks over a period of time. Once you're getting stronger, once your um, numbers are improving, that's all I care about. If you don't get sore off the back of it, that's perfect because you're making progress and not being in pain. Um, caffeine, friend or foe, lots of conflicting in info on the World Wide Web. Um, yeah, this, this is a funny one. Um, I think with anything like caffeine, you never want to have to rely on it. So if it gets to the point where you need a cup of coffee, then it's your foe. Um, like, like if you wake up in the morning the first thing you do is crave a, a double shot of espresso it's time to examine what's going on a little bit i think um you know i see no problem having one or two cups of coffee a day once you're not having them after like 2 or 3 p.m the biggest change for me that i made recently with my coffee consumption which had been outrageous was uh just cutting out my morning coffee so i used to get into the habit of getting up at like half five six a.m just having a coffee you know there was no need for it I was awake. I didn't need an energy hit, but it's just a routine I got into. So a lot of this time, I think these things are routine. You don't even realize that you're doing. Um, so just kind of jot down your coffee intake, look when it's coming in, and then ask yourself, do I actually need it here, or did I just have it out of, uh, or did I just have it out of habit? Really poor English, but you understand what I mean. Um, so um, again, if, if you need anything else clarified, uh, push on. Um, Orla, I see your question there. I'll come to it now once we get through the next few. Um, Sarah, I know the simple answer to this is not to fall off the wagon, but let's face it, it's going to happen. Any suggestions to get back on track a little quicker? Um, yeah, this is a really good one. I was at a talk with Brian O'Driscoll um, a couple of years ago now, and he was talking about the work they were doing with their sports psychologist at the time. And any time they screwed up or something went wrong, everyone had to shout, next ball, next ball. And the whole thing about that was just make the next ball right. If you drop it, fuck it, who cares? Just make the next movement correct. So let's say you have a bad, a bad meal, like you, you end up going out for lunch. Scratch it. Next meal. Make the next meal right. So if you go out and have on a Friday and you have, I don't know, like a burrito, screw it. You know, when you get home, have a salad. Like your whole day isn't ruined because of it. But if you keep going and have another burrito for dinner, a couple of glasses of wine and then some chocolate that night, then your day is fucked. One bad meal won't make you fat. One good meal won't make you skinny. So if something goes wrong, scratch it, draw a line under it, make the next meal right. Um, Dan, challenge, maybe challenging or obvious, but how do I learn to eat more? That is probably one of the best questions I've been asked in the last couple of weeks, probably because most people don't know how to do it. If you try to eat good quality food, um, in large quantities, as uh, I see Connor is online here, as Connor knows, it's really freaking hard. The main issue is, if you're eating good quality, nutritious chicken, beef, and veg, it fills you up really, really fast. 
So the easy solution to learn how to eat more is to eat more calorie dense foods. So when you're dieting, the goal is to eat large volume foods um, with low calorie density. So things that will fill you up easily, but don't have much calories. So like, let's say chicken, veg, that sort of stuff. When it comes to stuff like gaining weight, you want to do the opposite. You want to make sure you're eating um, nutrient dense food in low volumes. So stuff like, let's say nut butters, um, coconut oil, olive oil on everything. Things that you can eat very easily that won't fill you up. Like I went through a 200 gram bag of pistachios yesterday just on a drive home. It just felt like I was snacking. Now I have pistachio shells everywhere in my car, but um, but it was really easy to get like a thousand calories in there without even thinking about it. So for me, uh, nuts, lots of good quality fats like avocado, like coconut oil, that sort of stuff makes uh, gaining weight really easily. Um, also, you know, watch your carb intake as well. It's not too hard to smash down 100 grams of rice, which is about 80 grams of carbs. You know, sometimes you just have to shut your mouth. Well, you, sometimes you just have to open your mouth, turn your brain off and charge through it. Um, then something I've been working, wondering about, I train at 6.30. Uh, without getting up an hour earlier, it's difficult to eat. Any suggestions on how to eat for morning sessions? Ben, that one really depends on what you're doing in the morning session. If you're doing something like a strength training workout where there's not a high glycogen demand, then it, it really doesn't matter for me. Like, I mean, a couple of glasses of water and maybe a, a shot of espresso or a quick hit of some BCAAs. You know, the thing about it is if you've eaten well the night before, the day before, you'll go to bed with glycogen stores topped up. You'll go to bed fueled. And because you're doing nothing overnight, when you wake up the next day, you should wake up in a state ready to train and ready to go again so why not um why not just go into the gym and train if you're doing something like a high intensity interval training workout which is quite glycolytic and has a large demand for carbs then maybe some like some carby solution like a, a half a scoop of protein and 25 grams of glucose on the way to the gym it could be perfect but um like eating before training that early in the morning for me you know it, it's not something I'd worry too much about. I just get in and get it done and then smash a meal straight afterwards. Uh, ben, different Ben. <laughs> um, in, what's up, Ben? In males and females, how many grams of protein should you be aiming for to get in daily uh, for lean body mass in terms of grams per kilo? Um, bear with me while I get a calculator to figure this one out because the general, the general guideline I aim for for most people is one gram per pound of body weight. So if I'm a, like if I'm a 90 kilo guy, that's 198, um, 198 pounds, which is effectively 198 grams of protein in kilos. That's about 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. That's just my own personal feeling on the topic. I think that's where most people will tend to sit out, right? Um, if you're going, if you're going more than that, you know. To be honest, I, I don't know if you need to go higher than that. I don't think you do. I think your overall calorie intake from there matters. So once you're getting in a lot of good quality fats and probably if you're trying to gain weight, you do need a lot of carbs. Like there's no way to do it really without eating good quality carbs. So what I'll say is aim for minimum one gram of protein per pound of body weight or 2.2 grams per kilo. Uh, if you're dieting, I'd probably add about 20% onto that uh, for two reasons. Number one is to make sure you're not losing muscle and number two is to keep you feeling full but remember what i said back up here earlier to dan when you're trying to gain weight being full is the enemy so anything that actively encourages that can be a bit of a pain in the ass so about 2.2 grams and um, for someone with short legs and a long torso is their body type more suited to sumo or conventional deadlift that's the same bend as the previous bend with a different bend to the bend before that so um okay I think sumo deadlifting sucks for most people. Uh, that's going to piss a lot of people off and a lot of people are going to think I'm an absolute jackass for saying it, but it's what I believe. Um, and here's the reason. Sumo deadlifting is phenomenally technical. It requires incredible strength through your hips and drives most of the movement onto your glutes and hamstrings. So if you've got short legs, a long torso and long arms, um, it can be a really nice position to be in, but most people can't hold that position they aren't strong enough to pick up weight off the floor like that and it just ends up turning into a wide stance stiff leg deadlift if you look at like the best sumo pullers look at ed Cohen, look at andre belayev um look at any of the finnish dudes 
they all pull with this beautifully erect torso. Actually, uh, Jen does it as well. Um, they all pull with these beautiful erect torsos, and the legs are just being pushed straight through the floor to locked knees. There's no torso deviation. There's no swinging about. It's just a really nice, clean movement. So if you can't do that, then I don't think you should really be sumo deadlifting. And for 99% of people, that's exactly the problem. Uh, the reason I like conventional deadlifts so much is because they actually train what people are trying to train in that scenario, which is their back, uh, glutes and hamstrings together. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say for 99% of the people listening to this, they'll always pull more conventional than they will sumo. Um, so theoretically speaking, if you have the leg strength for it, sumo is brilliant, but for me, I prefer conventional. Um, that's not to say I would never sumo. Sumo is a fantastic accessory movement for conventional deadlifts and especially for your squat. But if I was going for max weight and max strength, I would be chasing the conventional deadlifts more often. Um, two questions from Gar. Uh, what supplements do I recommend or even use myself, obviously, when diet is on point? This is kind of... I partially copied this across, but I believe Gar's question was about strength training. So I'm going to answer this from strength training perspectives. If it isn't, um, whoops, Gar, you're not, oh, you are on the call, Gar. So if it's about strength training, let me know. If it's about muscle building, let me know because they kind of have uh, different answers. The thing with, um, like, okay, let's just assume diet's on point for everybody who listens to this, even though it's probably not. Uh, definitely 100% some sort of ZMA, so zinc magnesium, um, for recovery and for sleep, vitamin D, um, because, you know, we live in Ireland, it's a freaking, it's a cave here at times, vitamin D for sure, um, fish oils, uh, two to five grams of omega-3 per day, and then that's kind of the, the basis covered off, assuming you're getting in a good quality uh, multivit too. Going forwards and getting a little bit more um, advanced creatine, you know, creatine is the cheapest, most researched, most effective supplement out there. To be honest, it's probably the only one that actually has a tangible effect. Um, if I'm taking creatine, I'm aiming for 5 to 10 grams a day, usually 10 grams, which is way in excess of recommended uh, recommended amounts. But I've, I've noticed really beneficial effects from it. I don't know why. Maybe I hit a saturation point faster. Maybe I'm just a better responder. But um, I really like um, creatine at 10 gram per day level. Uh, pushing on from that is beta alanine again between two to three grams per day is killer it'll help with lactate buffering it'll let you train for longer and go a little bit harder it's especially good if you're doing stuff like glycolytically demanding sports like rowing like cycling anything where like lactic acid becomes a problem and um, then beta alanine is killer the one thing i'll say is if you start to get ear tingles or face itches or anything like that when you're taking beta alanine it's probably because you've taken too much so just dial back the dosage a little bit more isn't always better on it. Um, the last one then, like a lot of people reach for pre-workouts pretty quickly. Um, my one concern with pre-workouts, especially uh, like with, you know, NO Explode and the ones that are designed for pump is that the last thing you want when your strength training is a pump, mostly because it affects recovery it will affect the quality of the rest of the workout and it won't let you do as much good quality work. So stuff like L-arginine or any vasodilators, I would stay away from uh, when doing strength training. So, you know, something like caffeine is probably a better option in that scenario. And um, hopefully that works. Um, okay, John, thanks for that one. I'm going to answer it now because it kind of ties in. Uh, he, John has asked creatine, should it be a consistent long-term supplement or cyclical? Um, to the best of my knowledge, there has never been anything that has shown that creatine is harmful long term. So, is it safe to take long term? To the best of my knowledge, yes, it is. Have I taken it for sustained periods of time? I have. You got to remember, any time you're eating red meat, like the average size steak, has a gram of creatine in it. So you're getting it in your diet anyway. And um, if I was training specifically for something. One thing I always think about is it's only possible to go properly hard for short periods of time. So like when I'm going really hard or if I'm really focused on a, on a proper block, like competition prep or something, I'll have between 6 and 12 weeks of like basically body melting training and I'll do anything I can to support recovery and, and training through that. So like that's when I'd be taking creatine. After the competition or after I've reached my goal, I'll usually back off a little bit. Like to be honest, it's only ever going to be a small benefit 
taking it. But it's nice to have kind of the mental the mental backup of you know some extra little um some extra little kick up the ass if you need it. So for me, when I go into hard training cycles for six to twelve weeks, um, I'll I'll eat creatine like it's like it's gone out of fashion. Um, Gar, I'm gonna hit the becoming a trainer one really quickly for you. Um, what steps to become? I know you've asked, but you're mind fucking yourself every day. Um. Okay, number one, be really, 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 really good at something. Okay, there's a lot of guys out there who want to become trainers because they like training themselves, but you know they don't know what they're doing. They've just been chasing around, kind of busting themselves into the ground. Never spent time learning about anybody else. Never spent learning time learning training theory. They train people the way they've they've trained, and they train people based off of what they like. So, you know, for ninety percent of the people. I met when I first started training, what they what they wanted was completely different to what I wanted. So I needed to make sure I was delivering their needs, but also their wants. So I'd say the first step is be really, really, really good at something. Have a lot of experience and have walked the walk. Um, I'm not saying if your trainer doesn't look good, he's not a good trainer. I'm just saying that um, if, if, if you want to be a top quality trainer, you should probably have been able to prove that to yourself and to your clients um from there you know do a good quality training course um, i'm biased in recommending the elite fitness and performance academy because i tutor for them but I, I genuinely believe it's the best course in ireland and i think it's it's the one that really has the most usable stuff in it as well because you know look i see i see sean's on the call so hopefully sean will say something nice and i can repeat it back to you but the, the way the course is run is we do stuff that you need to know so like proper kettlebell workshops, good quality movement assessment workshops, powerlifting basics, weightlifting basics, power training for sport, um, and stuff you can actually take out into the real world. You know, three sets of 10 this, three sets of 10 that, it's all bullshit. Look, you need to be in a position where you can assess somebody, where you know what their problems are, and can take steps to correct and solve it. As a long-term strategy then, I'd say just... Uh, <laughs> Sean writes back going I mean uh, dot 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 you're okay thanks Sean screw you no coffee for you this weekend um, I think I think long term continuous improvement has got to be your thing one of my own personal values is Kaizen which is a Japanese saying for continuous improvement if you're not learning then you're dead um, I think there's also kind of a top level where your nutrition knowledge and your training knowledge is sufficient um, you can always know more but I think for most people um, change psychology becomes an issue so look if you know your client needs to eat XYZ they need to do XYZ in the gym it doesn't matter what you know it matters whether you can get them on board to actually do it so instead of uh, instead of just ranting and raving with them a little bit of empathy understanding what you're going through and then trying to help them along that way okay um, hopefully that answers it man if you uh, if you have any more you want to go into it a little bit deeper just let me know uh, guys, keep the questions coming. There's one or two left, um, and I have a couple to cover off here. Orla, I, I'm still watching yours as well, so don't worry. Um, while I'm answering, answering, while I'm answering Orla's question, uh, start sticking some more in for me, guys. I'm gonna keep this going till about one o'clock if people hang around. If not, I'm gonna leg it and get some food. So, Orla, does getting a source of protein in straight after the gym make a difference, or is it overall protein throughout the day that matters? Yes. Um, to both for me I, I want to get something in almost immediately like some sort of carb and protein mix within 30 to 60 minutes after training and then something else in again 90 to 2 hours 90 minutes to 2 hours after I finished purely because I, I found it helps me recover better you know over the course of a day total protein intake becomes very important but if you can get something in straight after, which you know almost everybody can, I see no reason why not to do it. Even if there's only marginal effects or no benefit at all, it's one of these things where you can do it, so why not? Um, I would look to get something like a whey blend or some sort of you know, easily digested protein like BCAAs even in straight after a workout, just so your stomach doesn't have to work to break it down because anything you can do to speed up the delivery at that point is probably going to help you. Um, Guys, keep the questions coming. I'm going to go on to Lauren's here now. Um, I got a message off Lauren there. I know she's not online, but I'm going to record. Well, I have been recording this, I hope. 
Yeah, it is. Cool. Um, this is recording, so I'll send it to her when she's finished or when I'm finished. Um, Lauren competed in the RIBBF National Championships there, I think is what they were called, uh, last weekend. First um, first figure show, and she did a great job. So, like, well done, Lauren. Um, your coach obviously did a great job with you. Her questions are, uh, on Saturday at her comp, she saw a lot of girls had really well-rounded shoulders. She does shoulders twice a week, but just not getting the shape. So I must be doing something wrong. Um, maybe. This is kind of... Ah, uh, Michael Gray's on board. What's up, Michael? Um, are you doing something wrong, Lauren? You know, if you're not getting the results you want, then yeah, you must be. Uh, what is that wrong thing? I don't know. Uh, I said this to Lauren personally, but you know, competition prep is definitely not my um not my strong suit. Okay, if it's powerlifting, yeah, come at me. But if it's anything to do with um physique or dieting down or getting on stage and being judged, you know. I'm probably not the guy to talk to. My take on this would be, though, if you're doing shoulders twice a week, but you're not making the gains you want, you might need to reduce your training volume. You might not be getting enough time to recover between workouts. That's number one. Uh, number two, you might be doing the wrong sort of training. So when it comes to hypertrophy and, and getting bigger or uh, shaping muscles, let's say, the thing you got to remember is your body doesn't understand... Um, your body doesn't understand weight. It only understands tension. So, you know, your muscle doesn't understand if you're overhead pressing 100 kilos or whether you're doing 60 kilos but making it 100 kilo difficult. What I mean by that is you need to start learning how to contract the individual muscle fibers themselves to lift your arm up rather than just going from shoulder to overhead. So let's say like a, a lateral raise. If you put your hand down by your side, don't think of where your hand is going. Don't think of where your wrist or elbow goes. Think about like actively trying to contract and shorten your shoulder. Like this is a really hard one to do, and I'm sitting here doing it now. But shoulder recruitment is a big challenge for most people. Um, and a, a way I've always thought about it is, if I can't sit here and flex the muscle, I'm really going to have trouble. Um, I'm really going to have trouble like trying to put any size onto it. I was watching a video from Nick Mitchell from Ultimate Performance yesterday where he was talking about it. Uh, it's probably worth hunting down. It's on his, it's on his YouTube somewhere. It's it's Nick YouTube dot com Nick Mitchell. Um, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the video, but if you email me, I'll try and dig it up for you. Um, so you know, don't be so quick just to look to get your shoulders stronger, but start looking at tempo work, something like uh. A 6, 12, 25 style setup might be great for you. So let's say a set of six overhead presses with a four second negative, straight into a set of 12 lateral races with a two second negative, and then finishing off with um, like 25 machine shoulder presses with three second negatives. Obviously, the weight you're using is going to be tiny when you're doing that because you're going to end up so pumped full of, full of blood, but that's okay. That's what your goal is at the end of the day. Sometimes it's best just to forget about strength and the numbers you're moving and worry more about the training effect you're getting out of it, especially because your goal is figure and physique orientated rather than pure strength. Um, that being said, I've been very fortunate to have quite strong shoulders my entire life that have been in good shape, so I've never, uh, I've never had to worry about it. And yeah, Orla is just replying saying it could be genetics as well. Yeah, look, it could be. Um, genetics are just kind of... Genetics are a pain in the ass, but you're stuck with them. So if it is genetics, tough shit. Just just work through them. Um, secondly, I was dropping body fat for a good stage of my prep, and then it just stopped. Refeed days to rev up the metabolism and leptin levels, a good suggestion. Again, dialing in that last little bit of body fat is always really super hard. Um, this is, again, I, I think you're being coached by somebody, so he's probably better place to answer this than I am. I'd assume he knows you better as well and knows what your, your dieting structure is being like. But yeah, look, refeeds um, are always a good idea. It's just the nature of them that can become the issue. Like if if you're not dropping fat, it could be an idea to ramp up your refeeds. You may need to cycle your calories back up for a while before bringing them down. So you've got like some sort of cyclic approach or you could just be um, retaining water. So, you know, like visual assessment and stuff is great, but you need to get calipers on you. Maybe do some DEXA readings. See uh, see what's actually happening with body fat levels rather than just looking and guessing. Um, but yeah, that, that would be kind of my thoughts on that. I guess if you're, uh, if you're not happy, change something. Like long term, I don't think more activity is your issue. I know you've been training a lot and I know you probably train too much. So 
I'd say for you, it could be decreasing training volume and potentially increasing carbohydrates a little bit. Um, but actually, I'd love to see how that goes. If you added in kind of a couple of hundred calories worth of carbs each day and, and took an hour off your training each week, I think you'd see really, really positive results. But again, if you're going to play about with that stuff, play about with it when you don't have a competition coming up. Uh, okay, that's all the questions tapped out. No, it's not. Gar's back. Um, Gar, what's my opinion on using sprints as cardio a couple of times per week? Uh, right, so here's my question for you. Why? So if... Why and what kind of sprints? I'm going to assume Gar wants to drop body fat, increase cardio, and is doing like straight splint sprints along a flat surface. I think straight sprints along a flat surface are one of the worst things you could be doing for yourself. Um, mainly because they have too high an injury risk for me. If you're going all out and then try to slow down after like 20 meters or 60 meters or whatever, the chances of landing bad, of smashing your heel, of pulling a hammy, of doing anything like that, the risk reward is just too high for me. I'd way rather see somebody do something like some uh, rower sprints, maybe even some hill sprints, um, if, if that's what they're going for. Whether I think you need to do some cardio and sprints a couple of times per week to drop body fat is a different story. I think for most people, good nutritional control, assuming they're already training three to four times a week is enough. Especially if you're kind of, you know, above that 15% range we were talking about. Uh, like, to be honest, 14 days of really solid nutritional control will do a hell of a lot more than a couple of days of sprints. So... This is this Pareto principle coming back, 80-20. 80% of your results are going to come from your diet and getting that nailed down. 20% might come from the uh, cardio. You're certainly not going to out-train your diet, though. So for me, I wouldn't use sprints as cardio. If I was going to do something, I'd go out for a walk two hours a week. Um, that's what I've started doing now, and it's what I'm going to do after this podcast. So I'm going to put on an audio book, go for a stroll to the shop, grab some food. Um, randomly, we have to buy food by the day now because our fridge is booked. Um for the last two days and I still haven't gotten a call back from the management company about it so lads get your ass in gear but like getting out for a walk a couple of times per week with an audiobook is is much better for me rather than doing sprints especially actually uh, and let me qualify that again by saying gar I know your focus is strength training um so you've got to accept there's a big recuperative recuperative demand from the sprints so if you're already sore from, from squatting, do you really want to go out and leg it and, and be at risk of injury there or further delay your recovery? I don't think it makes sense personally. Um, AC, don't know who you are, but what's going on? Uh, what's your thoughts regarding paleo? How do you get around the lack of energy on it? So AC has asked two questions and both of them are loaded, in my opinion. Um, everyone thinks paleo has, uh, everyone thinks paleo is a low-carb approach. Paleo is not inherently low carb. Okay, there's a wide range of carbohydrates you can eat on it. You just don't eat enough of them: sweet potatoes, carrots, butternut squash, any sort of um, rooted veg or tuber will have a pretty high degree of carb intake. For me, I'll supplement rice onto a regular paleo plan just because there's no gluten in it, and you know that's that's where I'm happy at. It's an easy source of carbs. The lack of energy, you know. Here's the good part and the bad part about paleo. When you eat like a strict paleo diet, you end up eating a really high volume of foods, but the calorie density often wouldn't be as high. So, you know, you're eating a lot of food, you're feeling full, but you're still tired because you're not taking in sufficient calories. So the issue on this one for me is you're simply not eating enough carbs and you're simply not eating enough calories. So it's not about paleo itself being inherently the problem. It's just that you're not eating the, uh, you're, just, you're just not eating the right kind of foods to support your training. So if you're a long distance athlete or if you're doing a lot of um, like lactate style work, your carb levels need to come up way higher. If you're feeling tired all the time, assuming you're sleeping eight hours a night, um, you need to eat more calories. The only way to do that then is to start tracking and seeing what your food intake is like. So write down your food for a couple of weeks or well, not a couple of weeks. Take track of it for a couple of days, plug it into a calorie calculator, see what happens. If it's under... 14 calories per pound of body weight that's 14 calories per pound of body weight uh, then it's probably too low and you need to start bringing it up and the issue there is that you're just not eating enough not that paleo is making you tired as i was uh as as we were talking about this i got a i got a weird message on facebook i'm gonna go through it now and just address it publicly um 
So when I posted this, I said, what's going on? I was training this morning in fly fit doing my overhead pressing deload day and I looked around. I tend to just chill out a bit on deload and watch the day and watch the world go by. There's a lot of people wasting their time not knowing what they're doing, personal trainers included. Now, I'm not ragging on them because they're out there trying. I'm just disappointed that their motivation and effort is going to waste. So I'm doing a free webinar, ask me anything, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and then F Philip comes in with this random, not cool, but thanks for the motivation. Quick to slay other James Hanley. I've spoke to you, told you what an inspiration you are. This is a game changer, though. I'm extremely disappointed reading this. Um, oh, yeah. I spent like, quite a bit of time chatting to Philip in the gym the other day. And here he is saying, I'm quick to slate his gym. Um, he, this is, I'm absolutely staggered by this. I don't know if he's misread what I'm saying or what the problem is. But you can clearly see here that I said I'm not ragging on them. It's just a shame there's people who don't know what they're doing. So I'm talking about people having bad form and bad technique, you know, People just filling time with useless buffers when they could be doing better stuff. Dude, if you've taken personal offense to this, I'm sorry, but you're completely misreading what I'm saying. You know, I'm not slating any gym here. I admire anyone who's in a gym training. I admire anybody who's on the cold face trying to help other people out. What I don't admire is stuff like this where I'm getting a bad name because I've said something that people are misinterpreting. Okay, so if you have some issue with what I've said, like, try and read what I'm saying, not what you think I'm saying. Okay, just because I own a gym doesn't mean I'm slating other gyms. I train at FlyFit because it's a nice gym. I know a few of the trainers there, and they're good trainers. But every now and again, even the best trainers fuck stuff up. And if I happen to see that, you know, I'll comment like I've said here. So, you know, whatever. If that's, if that's an issue you have with me, that's fine. There's not much I can do about it. But I just think it's, uh, I just think it's overly sensitive and a bit ridiculous to call me out like that. But anyway, if anyone's got any uh, any more questions, hit me up. John's running off. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow morning at this stage. Um, guys, I'm going to leave this open for another 60 seconds. Anyone who wants to type in some questions, go for it. Otherwise, we're going to call this an end. So I'm going to pull the countdown timer up. And actually, online stopwatch. Let's go there. 60 seconds. Let's go. Ah, love a good pop up ad. You probably should have just stuck up the uh, countdown timer. Oh no. Okay, yeah, uh, we're really getting towards the end of this, guys, because my battery's about to die and my charger's in the other room. Uh, Leanne, doing a detox, how many hours is it okay to leave between each meal? Finding I'm starving at the moment in the evening times, 7 to 9 p.m. Okay, good question, Leanne. Um, the nature of that detox you're doing is just that it is very, very um, tough. Okay, the, the week is designed to be tough because most people need it. Sean's under pressure. Tough luck, Sean. See you Friday. Um, you know, I think... Look, you've only really got three meals in that detox technically, so trying to spread them out with as much time between them as you can is better. If you're really, really, really genuinely starving and it's not just that you're bored or it's not just that you're thirsty, I would say probably get an extra meal in. So whatever meal you've had, just have it again. The way the detox is set up is that it has, a, it has really low calorie-dense foods with really high volume. So the idea is that it tries to keep you feeling full. If you're not feeling full off that, just add another meal in. It's, it's pretty quick and easy. So hopefully that answers the question. If you have any more questions, Leanne, just email me on them. Guys, uh, that's all I've got for you for now. I still don't know how to, how to stop these webinars, so excuse me while I poke about. But if anyone does have any questions, there it is. If anyone has any questions, uh, just shoot me an email, and I'll try and cover this again next week. I'm hoping to make these a weekly thing or maybe even a bit more regular, but uh, thanks for tuning in, oh god, oh okay, sorry, yeah, Michael, thanks man, Connor, cheers mate, um, so yeah guys, thanks for tuning in, I'm going to try and make this a weekly thing, so keep an eye on your emails, and I'm going to stick a recording of this up, and send it to everyone as well, alright, enjoy the rest of your day, peace out.